Hello, everybody, and welcome to the PC Gamer Show. My name is Tom Marks, back from a few weeks off, left the show in the capable hands of James Davenport, but I'm back, and I have brought with me Stephen from out of the monitor. I'm here in the flesh. I you exist. Are. I'm not a computer program. Stephen Mesner, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing really You're good. You're a real person. I'm Look, a real, we're, we're, I'm a real person. He's here, actually. Um, Jared thought I'd be a lot shorter than I am. You are taller than I was expecting to, really? actually. Yeah, yeah. I'll take it. I mean, I don't know if it's just the monitor. I'm a big boy. Yeah, anyway. We're also joined today by a very special guest, uh, Gary Birchall, for the founder of Fireblade Software, developer of Abandoned Ship. How you doing, Gary? Hi, very good, thank you. Gary, uh, we're really excited to have you here. We're going to be mm -hmm. showing off the game a little later. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, Abandoned Ship is a kind of FTL style piratey game. Uh, yeah, the internal dev statement is FTL meets Master and Commander. That's um, that's a good pitch. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> With Cthulhu. Yeah, yes. Steven, Steven saw the logo <laughs> that had that kind of like tentacle monster on it, and I think he got more excited than anything else in the game. He was just like, <gasps> Cthulhu Not to diminish the cool elements oh, of yeah, the game, no. but when I was like, wait, wait, it's FTL and Master and Commander and Cthulhu? Like, come on, man. My, my heart can only take so much. <laughs> so we got that. Uh, we're also going to be talking about, uh, I have a lot of games to talk about because I've been gone for a while and I've been playing a lot of stuff. So we're going to have a little bit of an extended now playing. Although I say extended now playing and honest to God, we just ramble and go too long in that section anyway, yeah. usually. <laughs> uh, but the reason S Steven and Gary are here, which I'm very excited about, is uh, it's GDC this week, the Game GDC. Developers Confer Conference uh, in San Francisco, right about, you know, like a a mile and a half away from our offices, so uh, we're lucky enough to have them in town, which is great that we have them on the show, but it also means that there's a lot of announcements happening and yeah. a lot of things going on and uh, just some a lot of games to play that we can talk about. I got to play Ooblets yesterday, and it was incredibly exciting, and I want to talk about that during the GDC section. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to be showing off an abandoned ship, uh, and we're going to be taking your questions from Twitch chat uh, at the end. So that's uh, it's all very exciting, and I'm, I'm just glad to be back. You know, this it's is good this, to be here. This is home. What, and what are you saying about my country that you recently visited? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. What was your least favorite part about London? Whoa, going for the least. Uh -huh. uh, I don't have one. It's got to be the weather, right? No, actually, so that's the amazing thing. The weather was kind of lovely when I was there. Right. The, the whole it was really week, nice when I was there too. The only th okay, so I guess that was kind of one thing is uh, the Thursday I was there like the Thursday before I came back, um, there was crazy wind. I don't know if you were in London uh, during that Storm period. Doris. Was that what it was? Yes, Storm Doris. It knocked uh, one of the chairs over in my garden. <laughs> it was terrible. I should, <laughs> I, should, I should joke about it because I think a woman actually died in oh. Wolverhampton. Oh, my God. So. Okay. Well, so the, the, the way I experienced that on Thursday was like we were walking most places if we weren't taking the tube, and there were periods where the wind would blow and it was like pushing my legs. Like every time I lifted them, it would like shift my leg a foot to the left. Um, and then we walked around Hyde Park just to kind of visit Hyde Park the next day. And there were these two massive trees that had just been ripped in half and fallen over from the wind the day before. And we were like, man, I guess that that was not just like yeah. a breeze. That was like a <laughs> yeah, real thing. To, to be fair, it was pretty bad. How, how long were you there for? I was there for 10 days total because I was there right. for the weekender, the PC Gamer weekender, which was, a, you were there as well. And yeah. It was a blast. Um, I hope if anybody in the chat was there as well, let, let us know because I, I Yeah, I it was an awesome time. show. Um, and then, then I was there for like five or six days after that, just kind of hanging out. Um, the funny thing about that Hyde Park thing, though, is that the the, Hyde, the park was just covered in branches, and it was like a dog's paradise. Like, there were dogs <laughs> everywhere just with, like, tree branch-sized sticks in their mouth. It was really amazing. Like, when dogs go to heaven, it's just that park. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. That's so funny. Did you say you lived in the UK? No, I, I visited there in September. Right. Uh, but the weather, again, like, people were like, oh, be prepared for warm beer and cold weather. And... Uh, <laughs> It was cold beer and warm weather, so... That's not so bad. Yeah, it was, it was okay. 
Will Ferrell and James McAvoy walked into a pub I was having dinner at one time. What? Yeah, that was that was an interesting event. Wow. Yeah. You Did frequent you very hi? high establishment <laughs> places. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just like a, he was in pajamas. It was McDonald's. Will Ferrell was in pajamas, actually. Yeah. Right. That doesn't even surprise me, knowing. Uh, actual pajamas or a film called Pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the other one, I'm right. not sure, but both. Uh, the, what, what are we talking about right I don't now? Know. This is the PC Gamer Show. You said so tangents were right. <laughs> yeah, Will that's... Ferrell and pajamas. <laughs> Um, it's like that that talk seriously. Yeah, Guild Dive. Well, thank you very much for subscribing. Uh, I just caught you there, but uh, let's talk real quickly, not about my my London trip because <laughs> we've wasted so much time on that now. But um, the just starting the show off with a little bit of news, uh, a couple things that happened, uh, if not today, then within the last twenty four hours. The first of which, yesterday, the Nvidia finally announced the GTX ten eighty Ti graphics card where. There was a period where we weren't even sure they were they were going to like Jared Walton, our our resident hardware guy, was like had doubts. I think at one point that they might like skip the TI right. entirely. Um, but it's I think seven hundred US dollars and a bit faster than a Titan X. Um, so lower price than most people thought. Crazy strong card again. Just kind of like. They're, they're not giving AMD any leeway, basically, on anything they're trying to do. It's heating up. Uh, yeah, it the is. other cool thing is the TI-80, or the, the TI-80, what am I saying? The 1080 got a price drop because of it as well. Yeah. Oh, so cool. that's now 499 uh, US, which is, you know, just brings those really high-end cards a little bit more approachable. How long's the Titan X been out? Hmm. Oh, man. I Because if I'd bought one of those, I guess that's the risk you run mm -hmm. with buying, like, staying mm -hmm. at the bleeding edge, but... I'd be a bit annoyed if... So I think, I, I agree, and I think actually the, the... I might be wrong about this, but I believe the gap between the Titan... Was it called the Titan... Bla no, it was the first Titan X, because uh, they just yeah. called the second one the Titan uh, yes. X also. Yeah, so the, the first Titan X um, and the 980 Ti, which like totally eclipsed it, was like... That was a super short gap. Like I would actually be mad if I had owned an original Titan X. I feel like and that's just graphics it. cards in general, though, because like every time you buy, like any time I buy a graphics card, like I got the nine seventy a year ago, and immediately afterwards the ten hundred lineup was announced, and I was just like, oh, I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I should take this back and wait three months and get a ten seventy. Well, I mean, so so that's the thing about buying graphics cards. So I don't know what your guys' opinions on it are, but like, unless you're the type of person who's just gonna upgrade every time, like, you yeah. kind of have to. Like for me, at least, I have to remove myself from that that like that mindset, that frame of mind of like, I got a nine seventy, and then they announced the ten series cards like maybe three, two, three months later, and it was like, oh, all, my card is garbage now but like it still runs the games i want it to run i still love that yeah. card i'm not going to upgrade for another year or two anyway so yeah like, i think the only time that would be really frustrating is when there's uh like a new series of cards coming out and it comes with uh like a new version of DirectX right. or something where you're like oh i just bought this new card and now DirectX 12 is coming on these next new generation of cards now I'm, that was like mm. that sucks but i mean the new the new graphics cards come so frequently that yeah I guess it's just kind of accepted. I mean, you don't want to stand in the way of progress because the new cards come in. Like you yeah. say, the prices <laughs> drop on. Stop making cards. Yeah, so <laughs> I mean, my PC at the moment at home is, um, uh, you know, they, they kind of naturally go in cycles and, and my PC is at the end of its cycle. So I think soon I'll be at the point where I need to do a, a complete rebuild um, and that'll be cool because I can get like a 1080. And there you go. Like that <laughs> That's and right. Suddenly run everything at ultra settings rather than <laughs> switching everything down. Yeah. Um, so the other real bit of uh, news that I want to touch on real quick is uh, the that just happened hours ago, maybe, um, is that the Oculus Rift and Touch controllers are getting a, a big price slash, or relatively big price slash. Um, the Rift is going from $600 US to $500, and the Touch controllers are going from $200 to $100, uh, bringing the, the total package, which was $800, matching the Vive's total package, down to $600. Um, which is a significant cut if you want that. 25% price cut yeah. um, is not nothing. Uh, it's interesting. I, I, I guess the main thing that comes to my mind is I wonder the intentions behind this. I wonder if this uh -huh. is them responding to falling behind in the race between them and Vive. I wonder if this is them responding to, oh, I don't know, losing a lawsuit to ZeniMax recently. Right. Like, there are a lot of factors that, could have pushed them into this, and I yeah. genuinely don't know what it what might have been the driving one. 
I don't like it's. I hesitate to say that it's like it doesn't sound like it's a good thing them dropping uh-huh. the price because <laughs> we don't know. But just given the current state of what Oculus is going through, and I think that like when we were at GDC last year, it certainly felt like VR was the next big thing. It was all anyone was talking about at GDC. It was all anyone cared about. And now this year, I definitely have noticed that like while VR is still really important, it's certainly lost a lot of that impact that it had last year. Mm-hmm. And so I also wonder if Oculus is just having to deal with all of these things in addition to the fact that VR maybe just isn't as hot as people were expecting it to be. So so the interesting thing in response to that is I think VR is actually much, much hotter than anybody who is making VR heads was expecting it to be. Valve has consistently really? been saying that like all yeah. the sales numbers on the Vive have blown away what they were expecting. Right, um, right. So Depends like what they were expecting, of course. Yes, and maybe, maybe they were expecting disaster. Yeah. Yeah. Just guys, we sold two. <laughs> um, One of those games. <laughs> yeah. No, the, and the other thing Panzer too in the chat is saying is that LG is now also throwing its hat in the ring. They're, they've announced right. that they're coming up with a, a VR headset that will like be using Steam VR and using the like Lighthouse system. Right. They're just yeah. making the headset. I mean, is, competition's good, right? Yeah. And oh, yeah. Lowering the price lowers the barrier of entry, which is, to be honest, a bit of a stumbling point for a lot of yeah. people. It's it's expensive, and not everybody has the space readily to hand for mm-hmm. certainly the Vive. Uh, I think VR's good in that it's given a bit of a shot in the arm to the industry. You know, the industry loves latching on to, to mm-hmm. new stuff yeah. and, and devving for it. So, um, yeah, it's... Whatever the motive behind it, I think it's a good thing for consumers at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I'm interested to see if Vive does anything in response or Valve uh, or HTC do anything in response to Oculus dropping the price because... I kind of doubt it, honestly. Yeah, I, that, I was thinking about that this morning. I was like, I feel like the Vive is in a good enough position where they can just continue to be sort of like the more expensive model. Yeah. it. I, I guess neither of them have like... Both of the companies have enough... Uh, and I, this is a massive assumption that I'm making here. But I, I assume both of the companies have enough capital behind them that they can like are are able to take risks and take loss going into this. Well, but Facebook and Valve have yeah, got to be exactly yeah. very Especially well off. Facebook. Yeah. Um, so we hear. Yes. <laughs> so moving on from recent news, uh, before we jump ahead to to what we've been playing, I do want to bring this up because uh, Gary. This is just too cool of a story. I'm sorry to not share. And so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. But, um, Gary, you've been a reader of PC Gamer for, like, 20 years or something? Yeah, so um, uh, I think it was uh, about just before I was 16, I got my first issue. And I've been uh, – I've collected every issue ever since. Uh, you know, read it always cover to cover and, and never missed an issue. Um, so it's really cool to like yeah be <laughs> you're my hero <laughs> man and, stuff. and actually last year when uh, there was the inaugural PC Gamer Weekender because yeah. I knew the, the staff were going to be there and I've, I've been in the industry for like 14 years now but it used to be a bit more sort of uh, console games so um, and I've always been a real hardcore PC gamer so it always rankled me a bit that I wasn't able to kind of scratch my <laughs> PC developing itch um, so, uh, yeah, because I knew the writers were going to be at the last year's PC Gamer Weekender, I thought I'd take along the first issue, which I bought, which I still have. It's amazing getting, that you have it, too. Yeah. Again, my wife wasn't so happy about keeping all of these, by the way. <laughs> um, we, uh, uh, and I got them to sign it. And then since then, uh, kind of for the other events I was attending, if I knew somebody from PC Gamer or, or ex-PC Gamer was going to be there, I'd get to sign it as well. So I've, I've collected quite a few... Um, uh, signatures and obviously we met at the PC Gamer Weekend a couple yeah. of weekends ago, uh, so I got you to sign it. And um, I thought being over here and, and the, the San Francisco office, I'd have the chance to to get a few more signatures. And uh, so yeah, I've 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 bought it here. So um, yeah, hold it up think the camera it. so people can see it. Yeah. So this is this is for the the podcast <clears throat> listeners as well. This is uh, what is it? What issue numbers is it from? Like nineteen ninety six. Sounds fine. Nineteen ninety six. Uh, uh, issue issue thirty three from 33. August nineteen ninety six. It's got shareware quake on the front of it, and the most uh, upsetting advertisement oh, yeah, that's showing off showing on the back to, cover. To um, but yeah, that. <laughs> 
yeah, that uh, that's that's a crazy cool little relic too. Like it's got an ad like there. Stop. Oh my god! It's got an There's ad a... for Warcraft Two: Tides of Darkness. This like, is so in this cool. <laughs> um, look how high Jonathan Davies' trousers are. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> Get those trousers in there. There's, there's a couple of like uh, really cool things about just just flicking through that. So one is is the little box out that uh, recommends you like now is the time to upgrade from four meg of RAM to eight meg. Like meg of RAM meg. is insane. Oh my goodness, Look, guys! Destiny is on PC. <laughs> 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 Someone go tell Tim. Not there, not quite the same. One, there's a read one hundred. Yeah, and there. maybe we shouldn't say what what it was and get people on Twitch to try and guess what it was. Oh, yeah. And then later on we'll reveal so, exclusively what that was. That is actually a really good idea. That's so so uh, somebody is asking real quick, or Max Ursa asked, as, have you got uh, Kieran Gillen's signature or Gillen's signature? No, no, I haven't. He was at a party just for Christmas that I was going to go to, but because um, uh, I think he was DJing, but uh, I think I was ill, so I didn't go. But, uh, yeah, I, I will do it at some point because um, obviously, you know, very famously, the his, the Deus Ex review was um, a kind of a, a big moment for him and PC Gamer and the career, his career. So There's a, a cool thing at the back, actually. So current readers will be aware of like the hardware section and how that's photographed on, you know, very professionally on uh, kind of white backgrounds or whatever. Um, but uh, in this issue, the hardware... It's actually photographed on somebody's garden. <laughs> it's so good. It's like joint flight sticks and wheels like set up on like rocks yeah. and bushes. And and how, so how is the hardware manufacturer? Steven's dying. I'm dying because that's so that. funny that, that 20 years ago, a PC gamer editor was just in his backyard like taking, taking pictures. photos of joysticks on the, on the lawn. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to not forget to reveal what the... Reader top one hundred. Yes, at yes. That point, so, yeah. that'd so be like we, worst spoiler, uh, worst ending. Ever. So uh, you, to, to what explain, you're doing, yeah, yeah. Or why don't you go for it, Tom? To explain that this issue had the readers top one hundred of what month was it in 1996? August. 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 So August yeah. in 1996. It's been a while since that's happened in the magazine. The reader so. top one hundred, yeah. I believe. Yeah, we do the the regular to our our own top one hundred mm. every year, but um, yeah, we haven't. I'm not sure when the last time we did. So the it's top the top one hundred games, PC games of August nineteen ninety six, as decided by the readers. So, so so if you can think what what PC gamers readers, and this is to to be clear, the UK uh, edition of the magazine. I don't know if that would change uh, tastes yeah. at all, but it to specify. Um, the UK edition of the magazine. Strategy games. Oh, what? Oh, boo. <laughs> um, it's not an obvious one, though. So, yeah, if you can it's guess what, what 1996 number one PC game, top PC game of all time We'll was. give you the LPC. No, what? No. <laughs> I'm kidding. He does not I'm kidding. Uh, um, oops. All right. There, there, wow. Question's coming in quickly. Duke Nukem 3D. Super Mario 64 says James, that terrible human being. Wait, like uh, James James? Like James James. James, get out. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> Jules says Deus Ex. Um, well, we'll you guys can, we'll, we'll ask again. You can think on it. We'll come don't, back to it. Don't yeah. cheat, and we'll come back to it later. Uh, but let's actually get to our first topic. <laughs> 20 minutes in. <laughs> I'll tell you what, actually. If anyone guesses it correctly, I will send them an abandoned ship t-shirt. Oh. Which only the team members have. It's heating up in here. There you go, guys. Gary has I'm set excited. out the ultimatum. Um, we'll, we'll ask that, we'll come back to that question around the, the abandoned ship, awesome. uh, demo and you guys can think on it, but no cheating. Um, all right, let's talk about more of what we've been playing recently. Get to the now, uh, <laughs> Should we get to the PC gaming of yeah, the, PC? the PC gaming. <laughs> well, we did the PC gamer part of the PC gamer show. That's now true. we can get to the PC um, gaming part. Uh, Steven, what have you been playing recently, man? Um, I'll tell you, Tom, I've been playing lots of stuff. So because it's GDC, you're taking lots of appointments, you're going to these game demos, you're trying lots of stuff. I saw something actually just before coming over here that got me really excited, uh, and I want to jump into it. And it's great because it's available now. People can, if, you, if, if you're interested in what I'm saying and want to try it out for yourself, go for it. But it's called Worlds Adrift. Um, oh, yeah. So Worlds Adrift is a, oh, how do you even describe it? It's a sandbox MMO... Um, a persistent sandbox MMO where you go out into the environment, you scavenge, you like harvest resources, and then you can build ships that f you can use to fly between these floating islands. But the game is built on this foundation called Spatial OS, um, which is like this new simulation 
engine technology um, that can do really exciting things because MMOs, the, one of the big problems with them is that um, you can't do a lot of really unique interactions with the environment because that has to be handled through the servers and that's just a lot uh, for servers to handle. But Worlds of Drift now has this thing with spatial OS where the entire world is, uh, has physics uh, so yeah, we're bringing up this trailer. So the entire world has real physics. Uh, when you like chop down a tree, you know if there's 50 people watching, that tree will break apart realistically, and then you can use those resources and you build pirate ships and you sail between clouds. And there's like this grappling hook that you can use to like Spider-Man your way across these floating islands. Um, just a lot of really cool ideas. One of the things that got me really excited about it was. Um, there's no in-game map. What you do, what they're planning on implementing is a system where players have to draw their own maps as they explore. That's so it's really an, cool. It's an MMO with yeah. just really heavy emphasis on exploration and a real heavy emphasis on, uh, on skill-based playing versus just leveling up and gearing up. Um, so as I was playing it, like there was times where I just did really stupid things because I didn't know how to handle, like control the game very well. Um, so it, it's, it's really cool. I had about a 45 minute demo with it. Um, there was a hilarious moment where we were building this ship, uh, with the guy who's running me through the demo. We're building this ship and, uh, we spawned, a, like we created a mast and it spawned on top of this thing that just, you know, like a matter compiler or something that makes it appear. And this mast spawns and he's like, okay, now that it's spawned into the world, it's going to have physics automatically governing it. So he's like, be careful because it might tip over. And I'm like, oh, and it like kind of starts to tip over and I start running away from it. But the way I'm running is the way, like, is the same direction that it's like tipping over. And this mast just killed me and I fucking died. And <laughs> he was like, he was a little bit mad at me because it was such an inept thing for me to do. <laughs> to ran down the train tracks away from yeah, the train. Yeah, so I did like the Charlie Theron thing. Just and get Prometheus. off the train tracks. No, it's like... <laughs> If I had gone just a little bit to the left or the right, I would have been fine, but I just ran straight as this mast like fell and killed me. Oh my goodness. Um, so it's like, like community driven in effect. Yeah, so they were saying like all the islands in the game are designed by people on Steam Workshop and right. then they like build them, like they incorporate them into the game. That's which actually is really quite cool. clever because then the community is creating the content for them. Yeah, and so it's just, it's a very, I, I could see it as kind of like, it, you know, survival games are a really popular genre right now. They're really fun to play with friends. I see this as something like that, except for you have all these cool added, like it's just, it's a very different type of survival game. Also, continue. An MMO. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just totally screwed it Steven up. People are saying you're too tall in the chat, so I, uh, yeah, you're hey. I brought you down a it's notch. Tough. It's, okay. Uh, yeah, well, then this was the game that, uh, they had like the beta testers build the world or yeah. something? Yeah, exactly. So uh, surprisingly, no one made any gratuitous islands. Well, that we know of. That we know of. <laughs> he was like, I was amazed. He's, they really thought that by like opening it up to the community, they were going to get some awful stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and he he said the, the community was nice to them and didn't do that. So yeah, I, it's just, it was really interesting. I really love the grappling hook because the game, the entire game world has um, like really realistic physics modeling. The grappling hook felt so satisfying to use. Okay. And there's like a climbing mechanic where you can climb on anything in the game. So like I was climbing on giant insects and they were just flying me around places. <laughs> uh, you can like grapple the insect and then just now you have a pet on a leash and you can just walk around with it. I don't know. For an MMO, like it's such a different type of MMO. Yeah. So as the MMO guy, I get real excited by it. So Worlds of Drift is really cool. Other than that, like I played Killing Floor VR, which was fun. Yeah, Killing Floor Incursion. Yeah, Incursion. I played that, I played that at the Weekender. I interviewed John Gibson about it at the Weekender, actually. Oh, okay. Um, that game is neat. That is a cool VR game. That is a great VR game. Yeah. It's probably one of my favorite VR <laughs> games I've played so far. Um, so... It's it's killing floor, except for just you're shooting in VR. So you're using the Oculus touch controls and like you have like two pistols that are like holstered right here. So you gotta like put your hands up and then you can pull up the pistols and uh, you're just killing zombies. How did it feel? Um, because the the Tripwire Interactive games kind of renowned for their their weapons always just have such good feedback mm -hmm. and, and just they're just a really good realization. And I was speaking to John Gibson at the pub afterwards, and he was showing me lots of photos of him firing guns for, for practice. <laughs> um, that does not surprise me. Yeah. But, uh, of course, in VR, because you're kind of that little bit more immersed, and if you've got the touch controllers, how did that translate, that kind of feedback? It's, like, there's not feedback in the traditional sense, I feel like. Maybe... He was, so he was telling me, um, 
when we were on stage at the Weekender, actually, that it was a challenge, right? Like, they, you can't do things. That, the example he gave was you can't do things like, like gun recoil in right. the same way. Of course, Because, yeah. like, if you, in a, in a video, you're like in a 2D game, if you shoot a gun rapidly, like, the gun will go up, yeah. right? And your camera will move up. And There's like, enough of a disconnect that your brain doesn't have an issue with it. Yeah, but, like, if you're holding your hand physically straight out and you fire a gun rapidly and your hand is not moving, but yeah. the in-game gun is, like, going up, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense and it doesn't feel good. He was telling me that a lot of what they worked on is, like, figuring out how much they could get away with. And in what way? So, like, he was telling me that um, you can't shake the screen, right? Right. Side right. to side in VR. Because if you fire a bullet and your screen shakes, you get sick. Yeah. Um, because it just is awful. But what they figured out eventually through trial and error and throwing up, essentially, in development, <laughs> was that you can't turn the screen side to side or up and down, but you can twist the screen uh, okay like you can do that not not a whole lot yeah. right but like you can just kind of tilt it and then you can go in and out very very slightly and those things if you don't go too heavy on them don't make you sick so like th that's not exactly gun feedback like they still have like reload animations that are really really cool and like detailed because you know that's that can just happen you know automatically um but yeah it was it was a lot of the like figuring out what kind of feedback they could get away with. Yeah. It's interesting, right? Because when you're playing a first-person shooter and say you have, like, a shotgun, like, just a regular first-person shooter, um, there's so many things you can do to sort of communicate the oomph of a shotgun going off. Yeah. Like, the, you know, crazy kickback or, you know, you just, you feel it. But when you're doing that in VR, it, there's nothing like that. So, like, I had a shotgun and I'm firing it and I don't have any sensation of really, like, firing a shotgun, which I think is kind of a detriment to it. But it's... In my, in at least in my opinion, it's overridden. Um, it's eclipsed by just how much fun it is to actually have. Like Tom, you were saying this, but VR uh, changes fundamentally what it means to dual wield guns mm -hmm. because yeah. in in a regular first person shooter, guns just mean like dual wielding just means your guns shoot slightly faster and you maybe have more ammo. Um, they're like technical improvements by having. Um, Doing wielding, but in VR, like I'm doing this killing floor demo, and there was a moment where I had my hands out like bad boys pose and was like shooting zombies, and it feels amazing that you can be doing that. Or like I had an axe in one hand and was slicing zombie heads off while looking over behind me and blind firing at the horde that was coming from behind us, mm -hmm. and uh, just those types of moments for me really uh, like evoked that sensation of being like a little kid and playing. Yeah, and guns. that's what I love about VR is that it's presented all these different challenges that people have got to face now. Yeah. And they're finding ways to overcome that. I mean, yeah. I don't know what your first VR experience was like, but um, I think mine was the, the Tuscan Villa demo with the first Oculus Rift dev kit. Mm. And there it's was a custom demo where uh, you could drive a Jeep over a, a rocky piece of terrain. I think I flipped the Jeep. <laughs> now, I've got quite a, a robust stomach, but even that pick. kind of, <laughs> you know, I remember sort of just going, oh, the chair. Because, um, <laughs> you know, that disconnect of my eyes was saying, yeah. you should be feeling this weird sensation. And my body's going, no, it's not. And that just really messed me up. And, you know, I guess I found that quite admirable that Oculus kind of released it out for people to just start playing with stuff mm -hmm. like that, to start solving those challenges. Yeah, and, and it's going to be interesting to see what things, what techniques get developed in, like, the last year and the coming year that are going to, like, you know, 10 years down the line in VR, yes. people are going to look back and, like, what things are going to be like, wow, they figured mm -hmm. that out so quickly, it's yeah. the standard for VR and has become the standard compared to what things are going to be like, I can't believe people did that. You know, like, teleporting yeah. is a good example to me. Like, are we going to be teleporting to move in VR games in 10 not. years? Or is that going to be like one of those things where we look back on it and we're like, wow, I can't believe we like settled for that in the beginning of VR. Yeah, I hope not. Because that is like the big detriment to especially shooting games in VR mm. is that like you have to do this snap to teleport. So the way it works, uh, if you know, you're, you're listening at home um, and you haven't seen this before, but how it works basically is uh, you use the joystick and you kind of just look on the floor and there'll be like a cursor that guides you. Um, 
or you, like as you look, you'll kind of have this cursor, and that'll show you where you're going to teleport to, and then you just snap to that location. Yeah. So there's no like fluid movement that you're used to. Now I played a demo of another game that was really cool um, that had the option to turn that on. And so I, I just used the joystick just like you normally would to control my movement. And at first I thought I was going to puke because mm -hmm. you're standing still, but your character's moving. And yeah, like I constantly was just swaying back and forth because it just felt so weird. Um, but I got used to it after about 20 minutes and it like. was a vastly <laughs> better way. I really endured it. If what? you if you play this game and feel like you're gonna die for twenty minutes, you'll really like it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm After sure. That. I'm sure. Like what I didn't realize because I had the goggles on is there was like some poor intern holding a bucket up, just ready to like catch. <laughs> but <laughs> my it's lunch. A I understand what you're saying because on the one hand you have this really immersive medium, and then you're instantly breaking it by teleporting around. So right, yeah, it is an interesting. Like challenge it's a very well. gamey thing in in. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, a, in a genre of games that are so much more immersive now because of, you know, like there's just something so satisfying about reaching over your shoulder and pulling the shotgun off. Yeah. That you do in Killing Floor. I wonder incursion. if it'll make a resurgence of, um, you know, in like Call of Duty, there's always a, a section where you're in a helicopter or on a Jeep firing a mounted gun. Mm. Oh, like, like uh, rail gun sections? Ra yeah. Yeah. We'll make a resurgence. Yeah, that's interesting. That would be something that would be easy to do in VR. Maybe I should have kept that one to myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, Max Urza pointed out that the when you're playing Elite in VR, the like the surface vehicles when you're driving around on planets in in Elite Dangerous, um, like are on a gyroscope. Like the like canonically the 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 vehicles gyroscopes that you always stay level, even though if you're bumping around. Okay. Oh, okay. And that like I imagine helps a lot in terms yeah. of not having the the rocky Tuscan yeah. village drive basically. Uh, the Cadmus just subscribed. Thank you very much for that. Um, Steven, I got to say something. What? The headphones, mm -hmm. like, have have propped the back of your hair up. So yeah, I got look, the Pee Wee Herman thing. You got, on. like, a peacock. I, I, no, I knew that, like, uh, okay. an hour ago. Okay, good. I'm into it. Okay, cool. It's, it's mine, all right? <laughs> Which podcast, <laughs> podcast Dude, I don't know how to tell this game, to you. But, uh, <laughs> but I have bald. chosen to shave my head. The second one, Steven. Not bald. Huh? Nothing. Anyway, um, is there anything else that you wanted to, to talk about or games wise uh no Gary <laughs> what have you been playing recently well um I uh just finished Limbo so I'm oh, on a bit of a really? mission at the moment and because I had to fly over here and stuff um, yeah. to, to clear some of my backlog my horrendous ever increasing backlog games and um I like yeah you know great game it was I think two or three hours <clears throat> and that's kind of perfect for where my life is at right now. With, <laughs> with, you know, kids and, and doing uh, the, the indie thing just uh, means the game time I have is, is minuscule. So short games, because uh, I love long games, yeah. mm -hmm. but uh, short games mean that I can at least complete them and move on. But yeah, I was really, um, Limbo I thought was fantastic. It was, I think I managed to get through the whole game only having to look at uh, walk through twice to mm. kind of work out. And I think they were like the, the last couple of puzzles or something. Um, yeah. A great ending, which I won't spoil for people who haven't played it, but it's, yeah, it really, um, it's just really well made. That game is tricky too. That game gets, gets harder towards the end yeah. in, in a way that um, we've talked about inside a lot on this show, which is the, the sequel or not, not direct sequel, but the second game, yeah. very similar game from the from the same studio, um, and in, in, Limbo is difficult in a way that Inside kind of never is, um, in my opinion. But like, also Inside is trying to do a lot of different stuff that Limbo right. isn't trying to do. But yeah, that game, I remember getting stuck on a puzzle in that game for like, like having to set it down and and walk away from it for like a, a day or two and kind of let my brain do that that background thing it does with puzzle yeah. games. Um, yeah, Limbo, I haven't played that game probably since I beat it a, a number of years ago, and I used to, like, that game was great. I never beat it, and I always kind of <sighs> regretted that. Uh, I played, like, a lot of it. I just never, for whatever reason at that time in my life, I just never finished it. I, I think I played that game on 360. That game mm. came out on 360, didn't it? It's, it's an older game, for sure. Yeah, I think that was on Xbox, I, I, so, like, I, I can't that help but years ago. appreciate the level design thought process that's gone into oh, it in, sure. as well mm -hmm. and the way it kind of leads the player through and yeah. and uh, and just it was very atmospheric. 
2010, actually. That's much much newer it's than I expected seven it to years be. Ago. It's still seven years, but like it's much newer than I I expected. I was a, just a wee teenager back then. Um, that's that's actually one of the endings. Oh well, this is the tr- the trailer on the. Oh Steam right. Page, oh okay. Right. So don't worry. <laughs> oh, well, that. No, you spoiled it. Yeah, they're yeah. not going to spoil much. Um, and of course, yeah. You know, famously, there's there's the spider as well. The spiders as uh-huh. well, and. It's as I'm a terrible arachnophobe, so mm. I was kind of oh. cringing a bit and being aware ah, as I was uh, yeah. playing it. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> the um, Limbo, it's it's amazing, too, how many games Limbo, like, how many games have, have I, I hesitate to use the word ripped, but, like, Been inspired taken by. very heavy inspiration from for their <laughs> art style. Yeah. Like, yes. after Limbo, there were so many games that were, like, Black character, completely black foreground, and then totally. like other stuff going on. Totally, because <laughs> even uh, inside has quite a muted color palette. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I kind of was aware of of inside and it scoring very highly and, and people enjoying it and stuff. But I only really started looking at it after finishing Limbo, and I didn't realize again it was a small kid. So yeah, they don't like kids. No, they don't. don't. <laughs> They like, they that's like murdering That's what children. I remember murdering about Limbo was being children. like, oh my God, like you can't put a kid in a game and then murder him like that. Like You can't do that. Don't tell Play Dead what to do. Yeah. yeah. And they did well, it. It, you know, Bold. it really worked because it felt, it just really helped with the tone and, and making you feel like you're alone. And yeah, you know, so I, I, I really enjoyed that. And uh, back home, um, I'm working my way through Far Cry 3. So basically, because oh, cool. my PC's, on the oldest uh-huh. scale and, and could do the a, a replacement. I'm working my way through some of the older backlog games mm-hmm. because I can at least run those at a decent frame rate and, and stuff. So uh, uh, and Far Cry is always fun because of, you know, you just got all those fun systems to play with. And I like the three a lot, yeah. Yeah. And I'm one of those people that enjoyed Far Cry 2 as well. So <laughs> Get out. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. I liked Far Cry 2. Wait, do people not like Far Cry 2? I'd it's a bit of a Marmite game. Uh, that's probably quite a clue. Uh, it's a very love or hate game. People tend okay. to have quite a... I mean, it has... Wait, wait, wait. I wanted Did to you say a Marmite? Mar- Marmite, like a Marmite game means love or hate because yes. you either love or hate Marmite? Yeah, so... That's an amazing... I like that. That's I don't know if it's over here, but the, the UK marketing campaign is is basically you either love it or hate it, and they're kind of said badge of honor. It's like a it's like a spread. Oh, I knew that. What yeah, is it like? It's like a meat spread. Yeah. It's yeah. It's you're, awesome. you're not making me want Marmite, right? Now. <laughs> it's kind of a meat spread. <laughs> um, well, that yeah, Far Cry. I mean, Far Cry Three. I think was that was the game that kind of got people looking at the Far Cry series again, right? Oh, for like, sure. Yeah. yeah. And then, oh God, what came out? Because it had Blood Dragon. Yeah. Which was like a weird uh, yeah. expansion <laughs> slash standalone. Really good. Was that a standalone game, or you yeah. had to have the third one? Yeah. No, remember. it was. It's completely standalone. That's so strange. It was like fifteen dollars, and it was amazing. Yeah. Ubisoft are quite good at throwing curveballs like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. Um, <laughs> I mean, Blood Dragon then also had like a crossover with the Trials biking series. Yeah. Do you remember so every that? now what? and then you'll get one that's a bit of a curveball too far, maybe. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I, think, I, I, I can't remember what we gave that game. I think we gave that game like a 30 or Let's something. Let's look it up. Yeah. Trials of the Blood Dragon? Trials of the Blood Dragon was a Trials slash uh, Far Cry game. Yeah, we gave it a 35. So it was, it was as you said, curveball too far, maybe. Yeah. But, uh, I had no idea that they made a crossover. It's interesting to me, Trials though, and Blood Dragon. Because I feel like a lot of people talked about Far Cry 3 for a while and Blood Dragon, like, for a while after that game came out, whereas the conversation around Far Cry 4 was like, this is a very good game, and everyone really liked Far Cry 4, and it was, like, really cool, and then kind of just went away in a way that Far Cry 3 it's, didn't. Yeah, so I think Far Cry 4 had way less stopping power than Far Cry 3 did in mm. terms of how it evolved the series because Far Cry t- 3 coming from 2 was just like this, you know, wholly different type of game. Yeah, and, it's, and there's a whole longer time of period as well. Far yeah. Cry 4 carried on, uh, arrived quite soon. Yeah, and Far Cry 4 was very much like Far Cry 3.5 mm. in, in so many ways. Um, and I and think then, of course, you have Primal. Yeah, right. Just I even snuck forgot in. about Primal. Well, it's because when Does Primal people... when Primal got announced, I think pretty much everyone assumed it was going to be what Blood Dragon was to right. three, right. like kind of this smaller standalone sort of thing. 
Um, and then it ended up just being something very, very I, different. Yeah, I, told, I just forget that Primal's even a thing. Yeah, it, 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 it blipped and then, then went Poor away. Poor Primal. No. Do you, are you really shedding, is that what you're spending time, shedding tears on? Yeah. I'm sorry. There <laughs> All the so problems in the world and Steven's crying because people don't remember Primal. There were so, there are so many good games that come out every single day that I'd like, I can't spend five seconds like being like, oh, one of Ubisoft's mass million dollar games like <laughs> yeah. didn't get recognized yeah. for more than a month. Like. Yeah. But they've, they've made quite a few games that have felt like they've come out of nowhere. Like, um, yeah. What was the... Grow Home? Sorry, what was that? Grow, Grow home. home, that little yeah. robot game. what was game? the one um, very uh, lovely hand-drawn art style side-scrolling platformer? Oh, uh, it's the one where you play... It's like the one where you play the... R it's the RPG? There was, there was the, the Yarny one... That, no, there was that art, not... there was that role playing game where you're like this fairy tale girl. Oh yes. God, uh, yeah. Child of Light. Yeah, Child yes. of Light. I like yeah. that game. Yeah, Child of Light. I was super excited for the story of, and then the writing ended up being like really an should, obnoxious to me. They should have ditched the whole like make everything in a poem. Yeah, but that <laughs> game itself, I thought that game was really really cool. It had a good combat yeah. system. Why didn't they re? I, I just that? like the a big company like Ubisoft that of course they have their big hitters that they release mm -hmm. annually yeah. or whatever <clears throat> willing to kind of take an experiment on stuff like that yeah no they they definitely do it, somebody's saying even For Honor felt slightly Valiant like Arms it came out Ubisoft? of Lo left field no Valiant Arms isn't Ubisoft what did you say sorry uh, For Honor felt like it came out of left field as well yeah definitely yeah. like even though it's, it's quite a big game with high production values I it? think like uh, Ubisoft certainly okay. I think has a deserved reputation when it comes to a lot of things that people are very critical of them about but I think as much as it's, it, they're a weird company because I think people are so critical about them in the sense of like, you know, one of the memes of Ubisoft is that they make games where you have to climb towers to open up more of the world. And there was a time where like every open world Ubisoft game had that same system and they just felt so cross pollinated that they all kind of just felt the same. Um, but on the flip side, Ubisoft is also this company that in some ways takes really admirable risks by publishing like these or developing these like really interesting weird indie games or even things like making um, a multiplayer only shooter in 2017 and then supporting mm -hmm. it into a whole second year with Rainbow mm -hmm. Six Siege. I mean, if Might and Magic Showdown they released kind of recently is this weird, weird game. I think I talked about it on the show when it first came yeah. out. It's bad. <laughs> like, like I'm, 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 at least in my opinion, but, like, it is a weird, risky game that kind of was not expected from them. That's the nature of a risk, isn't it? Sometimes right. it'll pay off. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, maybe Just at least Dance, the, painting the For cool. Honor edition will be a bit of a miss, but... Yeah, we'll see where it happens with For Honor. That game seems to be, like, precariously on the tip of a sword right now in which way, and whether or not it's going to, like descend into madness and chaos because of all the issues it has. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see on that regard. I'm hoping it pulls through. I like that game. I, uh, like I wanna I wanna touch on uh, two games that I got to play recently. Yeah. Or actually, I'm gonna go with three, just real fast, Let's though. Let's do it. Um, one of the main ones was, I got to play two games yesterday. I was at this uh, indie at Xbox sort of event um, here at GDC, and I got to play a bunch of games that uh, like, just, like, the whole event, to be honest, was, like, full of really good stuff. Um, one was Full Metal, full Metal Furies, which is the new game from Cellar Door Games. That's the, the folk who made Rogue Legacy. Right. Um, really good. It's kind of like Castle Crashers-ish, Metal Slug-ish sort of game. It's... It, yeah, it's it's <laughs> that stunned me. Yeah, and it's got uh, the the artist from who did Rogue Legacy, who's the lead artist of Duelist is like the lead animator. Of Duelist doesn't know all the pixel art in the game, um, but then it's got similar to Duelist actually. It's got these like more traditional backgrounds and the pixels on top of the traditional, mm -hmm. and it's like a they mesh it really well. Um, another game I got to play yesterday was Ooblets, which I've talked about before. Um, it's kind of like the Pokemon -y Harvest Mooney adorable game. Uh, holy crap, that game is fun. And it's like a year and a half out, but it's still like really interesting. Was that the game that was is being de developed by that that uh, woman who was inspired by... Yeah, she quit her job when Harvest when Stardew Valley came out. Right. Uh, uh, Stardew Valley came out, was incredibly successful, and she quit her job a month later to go solo and do development. Wow. Because she just was like inspired by it. Adorable 
Ublitz game. Yeah, Ublitz is really fun. But the game I really want to touch on for like a slightly more extended period of time is Hollow Knight. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, that's just come out, hasn't it? Yeah, it did just come out um, about a week ago, maybe. Um, and I was going to talk about uh, Night in the Woods, but I know James talked about that a bit last yeah, week. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I think he could probably speak on it much better than I ever could. Um, but Hollow Knight is the game that has been like consuming my time recently. Um, it's like a, a like a Metroidvania style side scrolling platformer where you play this little bug dude with a sword and you fight other bugs and jump around uh, like cave systems. And it's got this really beautiful hand drawn art style. Um, it's just great. Like it's just a it, it really fun very, game. It feels very Tim Burton esque. It's kind of got that vibe. It's got a. It's a huge map. That's actually <laughs> the the only complaint I've actively heard about the game besides performance issues, which by the way does have performance issues for some people, which is really frustrating because it's an otherwise really fun game, but yeah. it'll like hitch occasionally for uh, me. But the developers know about it and they're like trying to work on it. it. Um, the only other complaint I've heard about the game so far is it's too. Like, there's too much, it's too big, it's too long, which is, like, an incredible complaint for an indie Metroidvania game to have. Like, usually these games are, like, you know, six to eight hours, right. and they're like, oh, this yeah. is great, and they're done. It's like, to hear that an indie game is, like, too long in this day and age is kind of incredible. I love the hand-drawn enemies. Like, That's they beautiful. have such a, a yeah. lively... I don't, what the, I don't know what I'm even trying to say. They just look really lively because yeah. they're hand-drawn. The diversity of the enemy types also seems to be... There's like 140 enemies, and then That's there's also... Ton, like Each area has like a unique boss fight. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm going to check this out for there's sure. There's items that you can equip to like customize your character. All of the like story and the lore of the game, like the world is like... It feels very, very Dark Souls in mm -hmm. terms of like... It's this gloomy kind of dead world that you're slowly meeting the travelers within who are like the kind the the remnants of this lost civilization so it feels very dark souls in that way but all the time you're like an adorable little bug person yeah um, oh, it's beautiful yeah it's I, so much character as well yeah if you if you are a platformer fan i i highly recommend hollow knight um it's a very good game <laughs> like that's <laughs> that's just kind of the only way i can put it um it's Man, like, I, I I am a bit upset about um, the performance problems that I'm having with it. Yeah. But like, it's so good beyond that. Like, if the if it it's the type of thing where if, like it I I wish so hard that it didn't have that because I would have so little negative to say about it. You know, like like of course there's like little things here and there, blah blah yeah. blah that every game has, but like. That's the only thing that on this game that is like a blemish, in an otherwise like I just I just really enjoy it. Yeah. So what's it do? Is it stall, or is it just a low frame rate? Or no. So uh, occasionally it'll just like freeze. It'll hitch essentially for like maybe half a second, um, ah. and it'll just kind of like go eh, and then you'll be somewhere else. Yeah, and I that's can see like, that looks like the sort of game where that would be problematic as well. Yeah, because platforming, mm. uh, dodging attacks, and like kind of swinging in for little hits, because it is, it's too easy to compare combat to Dark Souls nowadays, but it is that kind of like dodge, hit, dodge, hit sort of pacing, and right. having a hitch in the middle of that is like, you'll, you'll get hit, right? Like you're just going to take damage. It just feels a bit tragic, because I think you look at games like that, and they're like, they don't, you know, they're not these huge, you know, uh, taxing gorgeous 3D games that, yeah. you, you know, you those types of games you almost expect to sometimes have gra like graphics issues or, or performance issues, but then just like a, a, a 2D animated side scroller has performance issues and you're like, how? Like, it's <laughs> it more, might be a compatibility issue. Yeah. yeah. I, well, yeah, no, I mean... Not everyone is that's getting it. fairly ignorant to the actual realities of game design, but... I talked to somebody in our Discord channel uh, yesterday or the day before who was saying that they've gotten those hitches maybe like three times the entire time they've been playing, whereas I get it about every 10 minutes. So, right, like, okay. you know, it's it's one of those things, and thankfully I went looking and the developer has responded enough to say, we know, essentially, which is, like, kind of right now all I need to see as, like, yeah, a, yeah. they're working on it, they'll fix it when they can. I'm sh they're sure they don't want it in their game just yeah. as much <laughs> as we don't. Um, 
So yeah, if if anybody is interested in puzzle platform or platformers or combat games or Metroidvanias, Hollow Knight is currently Knight. a must. Um, so I think we actually are going to jump by the the GDC topic for for just for Will because we did talk a bit about it uh, about what we were playing at GDC. You said you played Worlds Adrift, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And I want to get into uh, Abandoned Ship. I want to get into this demo, man. Yes. Um, so I'm going to play the the trailer you guys released. Uh, when did you release this? Like last year? Um, uh, yeah, it was in November. Yeah, and we can we can tell us a little bit about the game. Yeah. As we uh, as we go over it. So abandoned ship is uh, essentially a, a game where you take command of a age of sail ship and her crew, and then you explore a diverse procedurally world. So there's our exploration mode on on screen now. And uh, you take on quests and events, and then you engage uh, ships in combats. And, and we'll show you combat in, in a second uh, in its playable form. But you essentially maneuver your crew into their best positions on the ship, and then um, there's lots of other factors that, that come into play in all these different weather effects and, and stuff. So here's a storm. So you just saw lightning hit the deck of the ship, which uh, starts fires. Um, there's tidal waves, which can uh, knock crew to the floor, knock crew overboard as well. And we have giant, horrible sea monsters that you fight. <laughs> so the game's set in what I like to call a grounded fantasy world. Mm. So it's got to feel true to that sort of era of technology. Mm -hmm. But we want to be able to do interesting things for the fun gameplay and big sea monsters. Um, <laughs> So I guess what I mean by grounded fantasy is there's no floating castles in the sky or magic amulets or anything like that. Um, so the reason why it's called Abandoned Ship is because in a lot of games like this, the player is essentially the vessel they're traveling in, and when that is destroyed, it's game over. But for us, that didn't feel... Yeah, you know, We wanted to kind of explore that a bit further. So we said, well, if the player's the captain... What happens if the ship goes down and the captain's still alive? Do they wake up clinging to a bit of driftwood? Do they uh, make it to the lifeboat? Mm -hmm. What gameplay happens there? So for us, we shift into a, a, a new mode um, and the player has to make a bunch of choices. And, you know, your nautical career is not at its highest point if you're in a lifeboat uh, and you might end up dying from that. But at the same time, if you survive long enough and make it back to port, you can get a new ship and carry on. And uh, I guess basically as long as the captain's alive, then there's always a way back. Um, so, yeah, we can show... Uh, yeah, we can show off a demo of the game. Combat. Please, um, you can you can walk <laughs> us through what is uh, going on in the actual game. Are you okay? I don't know what's happening, man. Are you dying? I have, like, the weirdest tickle in the back of my throat can that won't water? go away. Like... I'm drinking water. I'm just... I'm just dying. So this, is, end, this, uh, is, this is the end. If you were at your house, we could just mute you and move <laughs> on with our lives. But oh, we lost Stephen. Oh. So we're in the actual game now. Yeah. So I'm. Uh, I'm just going to pause it. Um, so you can issue uh, commands when you're paused, and so all of the crew have different um, abilities. So um, this guy uh, here, I'm just moving, is uh, a marine, and he's better um, at melee. Um, <laughs> The navigator I'm putting on the ship's wheel because then he'll make this maneuvers bar at the bottom move faster. And the ship's broken up into different sections, uh, which are displayed down here for the player. And um, the sections have their own health. So when they go into the yellow, the, uh, so the sails in the middle there are now uh, half as effective. And if they go into the red, they stop functioning. So I've sent my sailor, who gets a bonus to repairing, to repair those sails because I want to move a little bit closer, which I do by clicking that bar in the left. Um, because and the enemy has a weapon that is uh, uh, more powerful the uh, further away they are from me. So I need to, to close the distance. So I'm going to send my captain here to fire this weapon against their sails to kind of get them into the yellow, which will allow me to get a bit closer and make their cannon less effective. Um, but also I've got... Uh, so, some other weapons. So I'm going to target different areas of their ship. Like I'm going to target the helm now because that will help me get closer as well. So th it's for, for people listening as well, the, the view of the game is kind of like a, a tilted down side view of your ship. 
So you can see all your little guys just like running around on the deck, but it's it's not what you would expect from something like uh, like FTL, where it's just like a straight top down, and it is all three D. One of the things I was I was saying, I think I've said to you multiple times now, Gary, is the water effects in the game are just They're flipping stunning. gorgeous. Yeah, so I just I just pause it because otherwise I might take loads of damage. But um, sorry, <laughs> we kind of. I mean, the game started off as, as just, uh, uh, it didn't really have an art style. And I remember, uh, I've, I've always loved those kind of classic naval oil paintings. And in fact, my in-laws have two paintings like that in their lounge. And I remember I was round there one Christmas looking at those paintings because, um, you know, they're beautiful and I love them. And I was literally thinking, if only we had like a unique art style that could really hook people in. And it just like anvil clanged, like ah, oh, staring me <laughs> right in the face. Um, so, yeah, it, it kind of felt right for the game tonally because of um, the uh, those paintings can feel quite dramatic and dangerous. Mm -hmm. And we want this game to be about kind of it's tough and surviving on the edge, and things will go wrong, and you have to overcome those things. So, it kind of worked on a thematic level with the boats as, as well as a tonal level. So. Um, now that I'm within range, I can use this anti-personnel weapon um, to, like to hurt shot. those. But I can also uh, ram. Now, when I ram, there is a, a thing called a brace for impact test, which I've passed by uh, clicking a button, but the enemies just failed it. So they're now uh, knocked to the floor, which is good because I can. Um, uh, they're not going to be able to reload weapons or anything like that, so they get interrupted when they're knocked to the floor. Whereas, uh, because I passed the test, I just stumbled. So I, you know, get a little bit of extra time to do things. Mm -hmm. And that could mean the difference between victory or defeat. Um, so it's all about kind of making sure that the, the player's having to make interesting decisions constantly. So at the moment now, I'm in the position where I've kind of taken the lead a bit and I'm able to make the enemy have to react to what I'm doing. Whereas, um, you know, if, if the enemy was better, I would just knock somebody overboard as well. So, uh, and, and we've won the battle. So, um, yeah, you can, when you ram people and, and you have this brace for impact test, if you fail it, you could get knocked overboard. Mm. Uh, and the enemy didn't have a winch on their ship, so they couldn't bring their crew member back. Uh, whereas we do, so we, we could do that. So you uh, just sunk that ship and got some some money for it, essentially. Yeah. So so now um, so in the in the full game with exploration mode, you can find ports and go there, and they're they're essentially shops. So um, let's have a look here. So probably you know money's up here, um, and this is something we just uh, just implemented. So um, there's a lot more visual work to do on this, but um, probably want to start by repairing our ship, uh, and then we've got some different weapons here. So. Um, let's look at what other upgrades we have. Uh, it's generally quite good to to be faster than the enemy ship because then you dictate the battlefield. So I've just spent some money on upgrading the sails. So now we've got uh, three masts instead of two. And I uh, probably don't want to buy anything that's too expensive at the moment. Um, but what I will do is um, buy this weapon over here. So I'll sell the the existing weapon um, by dragging it into the cell box. Uh, and now I've created a slot on my ship that I can drag this new weapon. Now, this this weapon here is still it's an anti-personnel weapon, but it uh, has a chance of knocking crew overboard. Mm. And that one doesn't have a, a short range. It can fire at any range as well. So and that'll allow us to kind of grief the enemy a bit. What's that What's that little fish icon? It's a zero. Oh, so um, there's there's two currencies in the game. Mm -hmm. There's there's gold and there's supplies. Oh, okay. So in the main game, when you're traveling between these uh, maps, because you can travel, you know, you saw the demo, there's there's tropical areas right the way up to Arctic. And uh, to kind of, the, the gating mechanism for that is you have to have enough food to sail between these areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you can also go to the tavern. Uh, so your crew are, are kind of your resource. So it's useful to have a full complement. Um, so I'm going to buy a gunner because he gets a, a bonus to um, reloading the guns. And then we'll go um, uh, into the next combat. And so in the, in the full game, 
uh, this is just a combat demo, right? In yes. the full game, you'd be, after you finished one of these encounters, you'd be sailing around that overworld map. Um, yeah. And then either find a store or find a tavern or find the another fight and that sort of thing. But in this demo, we're just kind of like jumping right. from fight to store to fight to store, basically. Yes, yeah, yeah. it's a combat-only demo. So, so yeah, the, the flow would be um, that... Uh, you basically trigger events in combat mode in the exploration mode, mm. and then sometimes those events will send you into uh, into the combat. So I have a question. So like with with FTL, obviously that's a game that has a very uh, you fail a lot and you have to start over from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is, is the elegant way of putting that. Maybe you fail a lot. Oh. <laughs> nah. oh, I try. I'm really bad at FTL, um, <laughs> but. What you were mentioning is because you're not really playing the ship per se, you're playing the captain. Uh, does it still have a, like a, a fail state? Is there still going to be a point where you just get game over and have to start from scratch? Yeah, so you can you can die, okay. and then it's perma death, and you have to start again. So we're in the process of sort of balancing, you know, because you don't want to play for too short a time that you don't feel like you're going on a journey. At the same time, True. you don't want to play for too long and then die at the end and want to right. destroy like the game because of hours. The, the time you've lost. <laughs> Wait, so, so, okay. right. so your captain can actually die. Yes. But if the ship is destroyed, that's not game over. No. Okay, that's really interesting. So I'm um, I'm just going to pause it because things are going downhill and I'm uh, <laughs> <laughs> I need to concentrate. So um, the enemy's got quite a nasty combination of weapons. They've got a mortar that causes hull cracks. Um, and the hull cracks uh, basically uh, make the ship take on water until you repair them. Uh, and the water gauge is in the, in the bottom left there. And when that reaches the top, that's your, your ship will sink. Now, we've got pumps at the back that we can lower that, but they've also got flaming weapons. So that's a very <laughs> nasty combination because, of course, fire spreads. Now, those weapons are very short range, and I'm trying to get away, but they've put my sails into the red and the fire eats away the section health. It doesn't damage the, the hull health in the bottom left. So I'm now having to kind of, uh, in the previous battle where I put the enemy on the back foot, uh, now I'm on the back foot because I'm having to, you know, I want to get away so that one of their weapons can't hit me, but I'm having all these things I need to contend with. And I've, I've got a limited uh, resource in my crew to, to kind of do all this stuff. Um, so I've got one crew member repairing the sails and and others trying to, trying to deal with some of the other stuff that's going wrong on the ship. So um, if you can repair the sails without the boat lighting on fire or sinking, you could, uh, you could pull away and like be taking less damage from them. Yes. Oh so, my God, that is a lot of fire. That I was just about to say that. Yeah, that. <laughs> so my, one of my sailors there is... Um, on fire? They're uh, near death. And oh. at the front of the ship is a um, a sick bay where they can get healed. But I need to, again, get that. Um, the fire's gone and, and repair that so that I can then heal that sailor before he dies. Um, but, yeah, this is uh, it's quite a nasty enemy I've, I've rolled against. I'm still winning the battle because their weapons are more... Um, uh, they cause, like, section damage rather than hull damage. So... I'm actually winning the battle, but they're not making it very easy for me. Um, and I'm having to constantly react to to what they're doing. So I've sent a guy to the pumps because the, the water level's getting quite high now. So I need to balance all these things. And that's where a lot of the, the fun of the, the combat comes for me because, you know, when you come out of situations like this, it feels like you've achieved something. It's, totally. Um, you know, who doesn't like to triumph against difficult odds? So I, I don't see what the problem is. You just let the water on the ship and it'll put out the fires and, and you're okay, right? Well, yeah, so, I mean, if, <laughs> if this map was raining, then the rain would extinguish the fires. Oh, that's cool. Which means that, you know, I, I've had a situation before where I, you know, I went one extreme and, and geared my ship entirely uh, with flaming weapons. And um, I came into a, a map where it was raining and I, you know, my main strategy was effectively nerfed. So I had to, you know, flee that one essentially because I, right. I wasn't doing the damage that I, I needed to. Right, we actually lost a crew member there, um, oh, no. which they're, they're gone now. 
Um, so you, you call them resources, right? Your crew, like, does that mean they're expendable? Are you going to be like running through crew and? Uh... I think it's your crew are. There is a degree of them being expendable. Do they have names? So, uh, yeah, uh, there's, there's actually a, a thing where um, if you go to the, uh, the, the <laughs> website, which is abandonshipgame.com, then um, we'll put your name in the game as a randomly generated crew member. Oh, cool. So uh, we'll do things like allow you to kind of replace these icons in the bottom left right. with uh, pictures of your friends and stuff like that. That's funny. Um, so it's foggy right now. Does that have any impact on the, on the battle? Yeah, so... Um, one of the upgrades we have is is a crow's nest, which gives us very good visibility, um, even in the fog. Whereas the um, if we didn't have this crow's nest, then at this range we'd only see dots for those icons above the crew. Ah, uh, okay. And we'd have to get a lot closer before we'd be able to see their health and uh, what class they are, because um, the class can often impact your strategy. If you have a lot of anti-personnel weapons, mm -hmm. then um, the enemy crew has a couple of surgeons who can heal people outside of sick bay. Then that means that uh, your, your anti-personnel strategy is not going to be as effective. Right. So I wanted to get close here, but again, the enemy has been quite um, proactive and, and they've destroyed my helm. So I need to put out the fires and um, uh, yeah, they're really going for me there. Um, <laughs> Meanwhile, your computer sounds like it's on fire, too. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. That would be an interesting twist for the podcast. <laughs> um, We're trapped in this room yeah, yeah. <laughs> with this burning laptop, can't get out. Well, this is Stephen's first time actually being in the warm room as opposed to the comfort room. It's very room. warm in this room. It is warm. It is, I've, I've yes. kind of balanced out, but when we first started the show, there was a moment there where I was very, very warm. Um, the, the, a point was made, Will pinged me also if we i don't know if there is uh audio in the game yet but if we wanted to oh, unmute it yes. we could hear it as well you know i knew i'd do that i completely forgot to switch <laughs> on the audio um so yeah you've probably just had some music come Maybe we on can now. turn it turn it, it down a little bit too as well as the as the explosions rain in okay <laughs> put it down but there we go yeah yeah, you're getting lit up right now. <laughs> yeah, and I'm quite, they're doing quite a lot of damage to me as well, so I need to kind of perhaps focus on weapons that are going to damage their health now rather than um, do section damage. Right. And it's kind of at the point where I, the helm's in such a dire state that I probably need to just focus on wiping out the enemy um, because if I focus too much on, on everything going you know, putting out the fires and the whole cracks at the back of the ship. So you're just letting the back of your ship just burn. <laughs> yeah. What does the fire actually do? It damages your hull? Or? It, it damages the sections. Oh, okay. Oh, um, so you're fine. That section's destroyed anyway. Yeah, although yeah, I've just yeah. noticed the, the hull it's cracks fire. there are very, very, very high, so I've does nearly fire sunk. spread? So I need to send my guy into the fire. Oh, well, my it's not God. Fire the fire and the flames. To basically pump out the water so that I can just stay alive long enough to then um, uh, finish the ship. So in the, in the proper want. game, then you would have to um, deal with those fires and hull cracks before we'd let you leave and right. go back into exploration. But because this is just a combat demo, then um, it's, uh, it's, uh, we kind of give the player a bit of a break. Right, so this is interesting. We've got a weapon here which is... Um, uh, much uh, more powerful the further you are away from the enemy. So we'll buy that uh, and then we'll repair our uh, ship as much as possible. I might even sell the lifeboat because we don't use that in this demo just to give me a bit more money to heal a bit further. Um, <laughs> but now my, my strategy is going to be I want to keep my distance because this new weapon I've just bought is, is better at longer range. Now the enemy's doing the same as well, which probably means they have some long range weapons. Oh yeah, they're pulling away from you, yeah. Yeah, so. There was a question of, it's a maximum of six crew per ship, is that? Correct? Yeah, so uh, the enemy can have a bit more, but we found that for the player, if you had more than six crew, you had enough to kind of deal with everything that, that you came up against. Gotcha. So it kind of meant that we could 
we need to strike that balance between making sure the player was having to kind of juggle, juggle without being overwhelmed. Is, is yeah. Tough. Um, so we're causing significant damage because we're able to kind of keep our distance here. Those red cannonballs that got shot out in the night setting are really cool too. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and there's lightning in this map as well, so if that hits one of the decks on the ship, that will start a fire. Uh, so so this, this weapon here is, is useful because I can target guys on the edge of the rail and that will knock them to the floor, which just interrupts what they're doing. Mm. But it has that chance of knocking them overboard as well. And of course, if the enemy are going to put one of their crew members to, to rescue that guy in the water, that's a crew member that's not, say, reloading the cannons to fire at him. Unifu said that the Titanic didn't think they needed lifeboats either, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do have... Um, so you can see at the oh, front... Oh yeah, he's getting winched up on the side there. Oh yeah, so I wonder if the enemy's going to bother pulling him in? No, it's going to let him drown. Um, but in the, the front of the enemy ship there, you can see what we call an icebreaker. And so we do have uh, environmental effects based on where you're fighting so if you're in the arctic sections there might be a combat that you go into that has icebergs and that will do hull damage unless you have one of these icebreakers in fact there's one of the enemy ships there oh as well. they have spikes on their hull too. yeah and that, they're quite a nasty uh vessel now so I, again i want to keep my distance because um i want those cannons to to be stronger at a higher range so i'm aiming at their sails here but because I've had, I've only got four crew, um, I've let a couple die, so I'm already in lots of trouble because, um, you know, I, I want to keep firing at them to whittle their health down, but I've also, I want to get away and I need the sails to do that. I need a guy on the ship's build to be able to perform some of these maneuvers. I might, this is a slightly risky strategy, but who you're dares gonna, wins? You're going to put three people repairing the sails to yeah. run away? <laughs> so the reason I want to do that is because once this bar fills up I'm going to ram them <laughs> what? <laughs> with the whole, their hull spikes? yeah so I'll receive a bit of damage because they're, um, they've got these hull spikes but if they fail their test their brace for impact test they'll get knocked to the floor and that might just give me enough time to make good my escape Ah. Or I would die. <laughs> is one. You're still and alive. I might just. You might. Have, I think you have a sliver. I yeah, think you have I like might, one HP left. I might just cheat for the purposes of this demo and Do skip it. to the next one, <laughs> so I can show the last combat. Yeah. Um, which is a, a terrible thing for me to do, but I'll put it down to the, the pressures of the demo live. Um, right. So I've I've given myself just enough health to. to you know, maybe have a chance in this map. So uh, this map is a storm, so any flaming weapons will um, uh, be nerfed in effect because uh, the rain will extinguish them. Uh, but also, if, if we, as long as I don't die before one comes along, there should be a tidal wave, um, which they're quite destructive events. And the, and the good news in that case is that they have eight people on their ship and you only have four, so it's more likely they'll lose someone. That's right. Yeah. Their eight people is a disadvantage. Yeah, and at the moment the AI are quite poor at passing their brace for impact test because mm. um, it's quite useful. But we've, we've done well here already. Um, so we've nerfed their sails, so we're at our maximum distance. So we can really, really pound those guys now with our, our longer range weapons. In fact, they can probably afford to take the guy off the ship's wheel while their sails are damaged. Mm. Ah. Right, they've got one of the weapons that we have, so I now need to pull in my guy in the back there. Oh, one of the ones that'll knock people off? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, oh no, I felt the... Um, oh, they've got a... Uh, right, they have a mortar, which uh, when it hits the ship, it, it causes a, um, a brace for impact test. So, yeah, me being smart, the AI have actually got a combination of weapons which are... Uh, are able to do nasty things to me as well. Um, right, Somebody okay. was asking in the chat earlier too if, uh, if the actual individual crew members leveled up or advanced in any way? Yeah, so um, the, uh, the crew get better the more they do things. So the, gu the guys that we've had firing the cannons are now much better at firing cannons mm. um, than they were originally. 
This is, I gotta say, with the like, the, just the, the the art style, but also like the wind and the rain and the music, it's all extremely piratey. Like it, it feels like a very, very, oh, that oh, is. That's, yeah, that's the tidal that's wave. That's the tidal wave, and yeah. I passed my brace for impact test as well, so nobody's gonna get swept overboard, but the, the enemy has. We've actually done pretty well here, considering I started with quite low health. Man, um, that like sniper thing that just knocks people off is brutal looking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, <laughs> weapons like that I, I call disruptor weapons because although they don't cause any like uh, immediate damage, things that kind of knock them through to the floor. So there's one weapon called um, the suppressor gun, which is an area of effect and it just, just knocks people to the ground for a few seconds. But that's really helpful when you're, um, you're trying to stop enemy doing things like, uh, you know, I could aim that at the guy on the, the ship's wheel and then they won't be able to move and I can make my getaway. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh, no, I just died. Oh. <laughs> I'll put that down to, to talking and not talking. Yeah, we, we were distracting you. <laughs> but, uh, it's sure, an unforgiving sure. game, then. Sure. And, of course, we've, uh, we've got no lifeboat to escape to here. So <laughs> in the full game... Uh, so the captain, yeah, he's still alive. He'd, he'd wake up clinging to driftwood and we'd shift into that mode and, uh, and yeah, away you go. Wow. There you go. And so uh, if you can talk a little bit about, I, I, I'm curious to know a little bit more about the, like, the exploration mode if, you've, if you have talked much about it yet. Because um, it looked almost like, like the Sid Meier's pirate sort of overhead exploring these archipelagos sort of view. Right. Yeah, so the... The main point of the game is to effectively stop this cult uh, called the Cult of Halifron, which uh, worship these uh, Cthulhu-esque monsters, yes. and they believe they'll bring about the end of the world. So it's not a game about trading or anything like that. You're not going to be taking cotton and selling it for a different price. It's There'll be a lot of quests and side quests for you to, to follow. I mean, we, we want this world to be quite dynamic as well. So, you know, your actions in the world should make changes. I mean, my uh, kind of favorite ex example that we're, we're working on is, um, I've, I've just called it Spider Island, mm. but there's this Sarah in the world, which uh, is, um, you know, the island's just covered with these giant spiders and it's quite an attractive place for sailors to go to because there's, um, uh, lots of people have gone there before and then their ships have been stuck in the webs and so there's lots of loot to go and get there. Mm. But uh, one guy from a different port will hire you to go in to retrieve some spider eggs from there. And if you follow that quest to its ultimate conclusion in a kind of more negative path, then that guy's kind of, he escaped from that spider island and has a bit of Stockholm Syndrome and he wants to create a new spider island in the port where he <laughs> lives. Now you don't have to follow that that particular quest line to that conclusion. <laughs> but even when, if you do, and then it's this breakout, you know, do you then help people evacuate? Do you fight it? Do you, does it create a new spider island in that location? So I want the player's actions to kind of have a big impact on, on the world as well. Right. That's so, cool. Yeah, well, oh, thank you. That's, that's really cool. And it's, it's, it's cool to hear that there's like, like, obviously, this is just an early demo of the combat and whatnot, but it's cool to hear that there are layers like that kind of on top of it. Yeah, um, yeah that's really, really neat. Somebody asked uh, if there, if it was going to be... that said that you've compared it to Sunless Sea before and was asking if the narrative is going to be kind of through written text or cinematic or that sort of uh, thing. Yeah, so uh, in the combat at the end uh, of each, each battle, a uh, text box comes up and... Uh, yeah, everything will be delivered in, in that means. And when I compared it to Sunless Sea, I've, I did that in terms of that Sunless Sea has a, a lot of exploration in terms of discovery, and we want to do something similar. So Sunless Sea has a awesome but very different tone in that you know, it's, um, it's very uh, wordy, which is perfect for for those guys and, and fantastic, but we won't, we'll be a bit less for bows mm -hmm. um, and more to the point because I'd still like players to move at a fair old clip through the game. Gotcha. Well, I, 
I, for one, am, am always in favor of more pirate games. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's an uncommon that's, opinion. That's why we, um, I, we, the kind of original vision statement was FTL meets Master and Commander rather than, say, FTL meets Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Because Pirates of the Caribbean is very jaunty. Right. And um, with the kind of things we're doing where the player's in trouble quite a lot of the time and it's, it's tough and, and grueling and you're surviving on the edge... It felt a little bit at odds to then be where my heart is. So <laughs> that's why we kind of went down the, the master and commander route with right. that. Uh, well, let's open it up to our, our Twitch chat Q&A. You guys can continue asking about Abandoned Ship if you'd like. Gary is here, so obviously we should, we should ask him questions. But you're also welcome to ask about... Uh, anything you'd like in PC gaming this week if you want to talk about what we were talking about Oculus earlier or GDC uh, we kind of breezed over that so we're happy to talk about you know some of the other things that are coming up in that regard uh, there's lots of questions to ask us tag us with at PC Gamer in the Twitch chat and we will get to them but we should also do while we're waiting for questions to come in is, I'm so excited for this uh, yeah if anybody we are we're gonna ask again the, I, for the record Oh, actually, I won't, I won't say this yet. Um, what do you think from the August 1996 issue, PC Gamers Reader's number one PC game was? Uh, please let us know. We should, maybe we should do uh, five to uh, two. Okay, we can, we can read then... down five to two, and then, but you guys are guessing one. Yeah, yeah we'll, they'll guess we'll one. We'll read you five to two. Okay. Um, so, Scarfington just resubscribed for 11 months while sitting five feet away from me, so I don't care about him. Um, <laughs> but we do. We do care about him because he runs the show. And we like Will. I Will's think we like guy. Will. Yeah. Anyway, um, we got some answers coming in. A lot of Civ, Civ 2. Ooh. Uh, okay. Chris, Chris cheated. Um, Leisure Suit Larry 4. I oh, they got it. I. <laughs> <laughs> Damn I, it! <laughs> I don't think Leisure Suit Larry has... I'm trying to think if Leisure Suit Larry has, has ever been on our top 100 list. I wouldn't doubt it, I guess, but... Uh, I don't know. Has a, leisure, has a Leisure Suit Larry game ever been good? I've never played one. Uh, I, I think the original was with, with rather cool. they made cool. so many of them. They did. So, I, like, at some point, they were successful in their adventure. Okay, so... Uh, as we wait for more questions to come in tagged with that PC Gamer, uh, we are going to, let's count down the top five to two, as Gary said. Um, That's what, right. What is number five? What did the PC Gamer community in August 1996 think was the fifth best game, PC game? This is a good pick. It's, it's, it's TIE Fighter. TIE Fighter. That's right. That is a solid one. That's one we've, ta I think we've talked about all of these games. Yeah, like all of those, it's kind of sad that we've, uh, I wish we still were in this era of uh, like real hardcore flight simulators set in the Star Wars universe because there was a whole whack of them. Yeah. In the 90s, like there was TIE Fighter, yeah. there was X-Wing versus TIE Fighter, there was... X-Wing Alliance. X-Wing Alliance. Um, and those just all really kind of fell out of fashion uh, for the last 20 years yeah. now. And it's like, those games were, like, TIE Fighter is really good. TIE Fighter is also really good because the story for it, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this subreddit before, but there's this community called, like, The Empire Was Right or something, and it's with people who are obsessed with trying to find ways to to make the Empire not seem like the bad guys in the situation and, and find, like, excuses to validate why they did the things they did that looked so evil, but really they were I mean, the you good can imagine, uh, you know, everyday civilians that are kind of see the empire as basically the police yeah and the rebellion are terrorists the, exactly and that's a lot of what it is <laughs> that the rebellion are terrorists um but what tie fighter did tie fighter did that so many years ago because tie fighter was this game where uh it was you were playing as a member of the empire and um and uh it did a really good job of like unpacking that and making the empire like an interesting and sympathetic uh, faction that you were a part of. Okay. Steven, I don't think we have time to go in-depth with every game. Yeah. I, I, as soon as I finished that sentence, I was like, I can't do that again. <laughs> I just got real excited about yeah, TIE Fighter. Yeah, that's good. No, TIE Fighter. Okay, number good. four. Number four? Me? Please. Doom 1 and 2. So I guess we've changed how we did our lists a yeah. little bit because we don't do 1 and 2 yeah, on yeah. our lists anymore. Uh, it would be Doom 2, though, right? Oh, yeah, Doom 2. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Number three, Tom? No, keep going. Me? You okay, number three man. is go. one and two. I thought you could read it. Number three is Warcraft one and two. And then number two is, unsurprisingly, Civilization one and two. So we did, th th that's crazy that 
three, four, or uh, four, three, and two were all like the first and second of a game. Yeah. yeah. Kind of funny. Um, <laughs> Definitely. So, for the record, before we say number one, uh, no one has guessed it. Oh, no. No, no one, one has guessed, guessed it. it. Oh. Even in the earlier comments, I saw some people got close, but uh-huh. nobody actually guessed it. Um, and so the number one, Stephen, what did the piece of Marie think? Uh, number one was Command and Conquer. That's right. The first, the OG. OG. So there OG. were a couple people that OG said... OG CNC. The o- there were a couple people that said uh, Red Alert. Uh, okay. Oh, but that's I, years close. later. Yeah, close. yeah, yeah. Uh, Command and Conquer. Yeah, um, great game. Actually, I want to see, when did Red Alert actually come out, the first one? Uh, How many people came up with Red Alert? It actually came out in 1996. What? Oh, okay. Really? Um, supposedly. Supposedly. Uh, it, it is what I'm being told, but it might have come out... So, yeah, it, it came out in November. Um, so it had not come out when this magazine came out. So Command of Conquer 1 was was what would be there. Right. There you go. There you have it. Command of Conquer 1 was the best game. It had that, um, according to readers, really 96. crazy moment, didn't it, uh, in the Nod campaign where you would, uh, one guy was giving you mission briefings all the time. And then at one point... Um, Kane just comes in and shoots him in the head. And then sits down. <laughs> I don't remember that at all. That's really? awesome. Oh, for me, that was just, I was like, what? <laughs> it's just mind blowing. Yeah. I miss 15 year old Gary Bunch. I miss Kane and Conquer Blown yeah. away by that. Red Alert 2 was my big jam. I don't think I oh, even played yeah. the first one. And the expansion pack, Yuri's Revenge. Oh, yeah. Kane and Conquer is a great series. Yeah. I nearly I'm, failed it's... my degree because of that. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. And, now you're a you game designer. What? It was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Gary, thank you very much for doing that. Thank you for, putting, you for a, putting a shirt up, yeah. you know, as yeah. as as incentive, no one got even it. though no one got it. Yeah. So how many people, get it? How many people guessed Red Alert? Uh, there were at least two. Jules M. I know did, um, and then uh, they were close enough. Else. I'll I'll sort them out. Uh, <laughs> okay, like, well, if, if, uh, you're a good man. I don't know best way to uh, on on the website, which is abandonedshipgame.com, on the contact page. Just um, uh, we'll work something out, and I'll. I'll Email one of those email addresses and I'll pick it up. Well, Jules is in the Discord. We can, yeah. Yeah. um, Jules is a regular too. Uh, But let's take a couple questions before we run out of time because I want to know uh, what you guys are thinking. There was a couple questions from people asking if there are sea shanties in Abandoned Ship. I'm undecided on that. Okay. Because you did just kind of like throw shade at sea shanties a moment ago. Yeah, and this is is why I love uh, being indie because it's, you know, it's my game, so I can kind of just completely <laughs> U-turn and pivot on things like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know, because yes, it's not it doesn't fit the tone that I was going for. However, lots of people have asked for it, and I'm humble enough to to kind of go. What well, if people like sea shanties? They don't have to be jaunty. Mm-hmm. Um, that was actually, if I may, that's one of the the things I remember most about playing Sid Meier's Pirates was when you were on the overworld map, if you were just like sailing through open ocean for a little while, your guys would just start like singing from the boat. Yeah. You'd hear them like yeah. quietly going and it's, along. It is endearing. So watch this space. Basically, if enough people ask for it, then yes, I would I'd certainly consider it. Uh, crew members have specialties. Lucier asks, will, the, will their skill at a specific job be influenced by where they were recruited? Example, a crew member recruited in the Arctic proficient at hull repair. Uh, no, it's class-based rather than location-based. Gotcha. There will be differences in the shops for the sort of things that are available, um, but there'll be more upgrades and, and weapons and stuff like that. Um there's a real quick question that I do want to answer because I, I think it's cute. I just put these up. Uh, Battle Tank asked what these little block things are. Uh, you can't see them, but there's there's two more above. They're from a game called Death Squared. That was I was sent them by the developers uh, actually while I was gone. Um, Death Squared is this co-op up to four player puzzle game that is coming out in like two weeks and. I will almost surely talk about in really, two weeks because yeah. it's Hang like... On, was the arrow pointing at me? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I realized I just held it up. Yeah. And it was, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm with a stupid A subtle arrow. insult. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Thanks but for yeah. having me. <laughs> co-op Get off game, our show. Co-op game called Death Squared, really, really fun. So keep an eye out for it. I'm sure I'll talk about it again. <clears> but <throat> I thought they were cute, so I put them on the set. Uh, there were a couple more questions, though, that I do want to grab if we... Real quick, because we didn't have too much time... Uh, at earlier, uh, where'd they go? Oh my goodness. Um, 
I know we talk about stories untold on today's show. We didn't talk about stories untold, but we did do a review. Andy Kelly reviewed stories untold. I believe he he liked it. Uh, so if you go to pcgamer.com slash stories dash untold dash review, you can read his full thoughts there. Uh, and then the last question I want to take from Varen Deal was, if you could pair any IP with a genre it's not known for Ooh. to create a game you'd want to play, what would it be? For example, I'd love an XCOM-style Mass Effect game. That is a cool wow. idea. That's uh, a very good, good question. question. Yeah, it's a really good, good question. question. Uh, I'm going to real quickly just shoot out and say uh, the first thing that jumped into my head was like a Total War-style Witcher game. Like yeah, like like Nor- Nelfgaard. Like oh, uh, I am really excited by that idea. That, yeah. I think that'd be cool. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, uh, a a a leisure suit, Larry City Builder. <laughs> 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 Do you spy on everybody? In the city? <laughs> oh, 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 man. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't think of anything that I would be genuinely... Um, it's a good question, and it I, it's, it's a shame really I didn't question. take it earlier, because there's, there's... It's a, a question I feel like you kind of need to think about, because there's there's games that, of course, I don't know. There's, there's good answers and there's bad answers to that question, I think. I love Witcher Total War style, though. Yeah. Um, I'm a massive fan of Total War, so I... I'd be very interested to see if you could somehow transfer, uh, you know, like a Supreme Commander, you could uh, zoom into the map mm-hmm. and then pull out and see it at a very sort of uh, uh, strategic layer. But by just flicking your mouse wheel, I would love to see if Creative Assembly could do a Total War game that is actually real time, but you're able to look at I don't know if it's uh, medieval times, say, the Europe, and zoom in and see units, armies marching. That's quite grand, but I think that would be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, I, there were games... There Occasionally games come along that experiment with that type of thing of, like, taking over individual units in RTS combat, but I haven't seen one that I think really does it, like, like screamingly well yet. There's, um, there's two things, actually. I don't know if I should say this, but there's two ideas I have that if Abandoned Ship is successful, I would love to investigate. Hmm. And I'll say this, and if somebody beats me to the punch, I'll obviously regret it, but one is an FTL game, but kind of mixed with that kind of Mass Effect story-driven stuff, like being on the Normandy and mm. being able to go around your ship in, in third person. Um, and... And the other is kind of a do you remember Battle for Middle Earth? Yeah, yeah. I love those games. And that kind of high fantasy, but um, uh, a bit more sort of uh, permadeath, where it's you're kind of at the, the end of the world, and it's which choices you make, it sort of dictates whether you actually escape the end of the world mm-hmm. triumph or triumph. Or, so th- those are two things I'd like hmm. to explore. But yeah. I'm going to say. Pokemon as GTA. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Um, the, a couple we got from the chat actually was a Bioshock oh, as Pokemon. a city builder. Underwater cool. city builder. Yeah, I like in that. The sky that city is builder. Cool, yeah. And then another one interviews her says, Sam and Max as a dark, gritty, third-person noir shooter like Max Payne. I love that. It's already I got the that. name Sam and Max Payne is already yeah. written, right? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Already yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Um, I would... Uh, well, I guess it's already been announced, but like I... Just about any game, but with the Nemesis system from Shadow yes. of Wardor. Oh, yeah, we didn't talk about Shadow yeah. of Wardor oh, yeah. Sh- is coming Shadow out. Shadow of Wardor. Well, it's Shadow of War, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, battle, what, what is the name of that game? Middle Earth? Shadow Middle of War, Earth, Shadow of War. Shadow so of War is the Shadow is the of Mordor is the right. first one. So, I mean, just about any game using that Nemesis system, I think, would be awesome. Like, so, I was executive producer on a, a game that was, uh, I was working with Sam Barlow, the guy who did Han- her story. Mm. Oh, yeah. And, um... That that game got canned, but um, about a year afterwards, it might have been that long, when Shadow of Mordor got announced, there was a lot of very similar things that, that we were doing. So in a way, it was very cool to see kind of the game that got canned for us with like, uh, you know, a kind of spectral uh, ally that's, that's with you mm. and a lot of the combat system stuff that we were trying to see that realised in... Mm-hmm. Shadow of Mordor, 
and realised beautifully as well because I, I love that game. Yeah. Uh, so that was yeah. I, more Shadow of Mordor is is it's coming out in like August, which is. Yeah, I love. I, I'm just gonna real quickly. We're we're out of time, but I I'm real quickly gonna say I love when games announce themselves and like AAA games specifically announce themselves and then are like also oh, here's a release date in six months. Yeah. yeah. Like I really more like. I really like when AAA games kind of like keep the hype train a little bit yeah. shorter. Um, and I don't know much about Shadow of War. I don't think many of us do yet, but it's I I like Shadow of Mordor. I'm I'm looking forward I would to be whatever happy this will for be. More. Yeah, basically. Yeah. I want her story, but with a nemesis system. That's my last one. <laughs> Steven, you said you said more nemesis. <laughs> her story with a nemesis system. That's oh all the God. time we I got. I want today. any Japanese visual novel. <laughs> like like a, a Japanese romance game, but with a nemesis system. <laughs> okay, we're getting silly. Yeah. Too silly now. Too silly. Sorry. It's like the, the Monty Python. Tone it down, sketch. Steve. Too silly, Tone it too down. Silly. Get on with it. <laughs> um, if anybody, anybody Monty Python? Anybody? that reference? No, okay. Anyway, uh, I, I thank you, everyone. I'm glad to be back. Uh, Gary and Steven, thank you for being here in yeah. person. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you for showing off Abandoned Ship. I'm glad you had fun. It's good. And uh, we're... Please, everyone, come back next week, twitch.tv slash PCGamer, Wednesday, 1 p.m. Pacific time, or youtube.com slash PCGamer, or pcgamer.com slash podcast, all of those places. Uh, leave us some comments. Send me an email at tom at pcgamer.com if you have any comments. Uh, send me an email. Also, one of the things, this is one of the things I really wanted to say, uh, James took over hosting for two weeks. I love James to death. Tell me what he did better. Um, I would really like to know. Like, genuinely, like, I really want to know what you guys liked or disliked about this difference if there's anything you'd like to see changed uh or or different we'd love to hear from you that's a he's not as handsome <laughs> he's not as handsome distractingly handsome uh, yeah okay that's a you Can might have opened pandora's box with that question <laughs> <laughs> yeah bring it on guys <laughs> <laughs> make tom cry um no okay guys we're out of time by a lot so thank you very very much again for joining us guys and we will see you next week bye bye